Hey guys, it's Bella and in this episode I am going to show you how to read the medieval script that you will get in medieval fight books where you can learn medieval martial arts. So this is basically my area of greatest expertise so I'm very excited to talk to you about it. And what this is, is Litera Gothica Bastarda or um, Bastard Gothic script, which is written between the 13th and the 15th centuries. Um, first, however, it's worth recapping the formal Gothic script because it's sort of a spectrum with Bastard script. So Litera Gothica Textualis or Calligraphic Gothic script is a minuscule script which developed in its proper form in the 13th century. It would go on to be the first script used in printing, most famously by the Gutenberg Press. And its distinguishing features include a H with a slight left-leaning descender and lozenge-shaped endings on minims, a thick nib and the formation of curved letters with short vertical strokes, especially minims, which resulted in quite a lot of confusion between different letters. Um, so the I, the U, the M, they all sort of look the same. They had quite developed punctuation, including dotted I's, full stops, and sometimes they even used commas. There was frequent abbreviation and biting of vowels with adjacent consonants. There was more frequent use of the tall, sorry, of the rounded majuscule S than the tall S which was used in Carolingian and Proto-Gothic. And they were differentiating Gothic scripts much more between I, J, and U, V, and W because these were used for writing vernacular names which were increasingly entering into Latin texts. And also they would mark, they would draw in margins and lines in pencil instead of scoring them on the page. And here is the, here are the letters of Gothic Textura and you can note those features. I'm not going to properly discuss these features because we've already got a video discussing those, which you can see in the uh, Paleography Guides playlist. But here is, to my knowledge thus far, the only um, medieval fight book which I know of to be written in sort of formal calligraphic gothic script. And this is the um, Paris BNF MS Francais um, 1996. I'm not going to try saying that in French. And this is from it, Folio 2R. And it's quite interesting in many ways. So it's this is a um, 14th century manuscript written supposedly by a Milanese fencing instructor for a uh, Burgundian lord. So it's written in French. It might be a translation of an original in Italian. It's hard to say. And um, you'll notice here that there's this sort of square that's left blank and it could have been intended for capitals. But given that the capitals are actually written in, people have theorised, I believe it's... Um, Henry Dupuy has uh, theorised that this is a space where drawing was meant to be written, but then the manuscript was never completed and so it wasn't finished. Um, Ernest Francais uh, 1996 is interesting for several reasons, um, among which being that it, along with I think Fiore de Libri, is possibly the only um, um, 15th century fight book to discuss what to do if you're left-handed or if you're facing a left-handed opponent. It's really interesting. Um, and this is the prologue where it describes the art of the book, which is called um, The Play of the Axe. So if I read it in, forgive me, quite bad medieval French, Ensuite, le prologue du jeu de la hache pour soi habilitaire est effectué en avance. So here begins the prologue of the play of the axe, and I believe this is uh, hmm. to to be capable in defense and attack. I think, although I'm not certain. Um, on seed and then reading from the black text, on seed devant et voyant par expérience, que naturellement tous corps humains, nobles et non nobles, fuyant la mort et Decivant vivre longuement et en ce mortel monde, et après au royalne, royaline de paradis, vivre par durablement, pour parvenu et obtenu des désirs naturellement désirs. Is me semble que toute créature humaine est raisonnable se devoit tenir 
in Bonn is that it soy of and then it cuts off so what this says is um one should and we have learned through experience that naturally each human body noble and ignoble flee death and desire to live longly for a long time in this mortal world and i'm not sure about the uh fourth line from the bottom frankly um i think this is and after their death they desire to um to eat of the fruit of paradise and, and enjoy the benefits oh no sorry um and before the kingdom of paradise they desire to live for a long time um so in in order to arrive at and obtain uh these desires na the, the desires naturally it occurs to me that each human creature and reasonable creature should hold themselves in good state in good health and and then and in it in its and then it's cuts off um this text is quite interesting for a few reasons but among them being that it actually although it's a text that teaches you how to fight with a pole axe so in two hands and in armor it actually says that the techniques of the pole axe are the same that can be used to defend yourself with any other weapon so with a dagger a stick a sword etc which is very interesting noting that other medieval authors such as Fiore de Liberty and uh Lichtenauer um they don't say exactly the same thing but they do imply that all martial arts are sort of one art at the core of it so there might be a sort of kernel to many of the western european fighting systems that persists across all of them and they have this shared concept that all martial arts are sort of one and the same for now we should talk about some history for context beyond the specifics of the fight book and these are the emergences and developments of vernacular and private writings so from the 13th century onwards we had the first paper mills established in western europe um first of all in france i believe it said avignon was the first one and because of these secular scriptoria which we'll cover in the next lecture parchment was much more readily available than it had been before so because of this vernacular and secular writing flourished hand in hand because the need to write in vernacular scripts emerges sorry in vernacular languages this need emerges when a nobility is seeking to use the written word outside of a religious context but because it's outside of religious context they may not necessarily want to spend all of that time learning latin so this tells us that writing was being used for administrative purposes possibly for dealing with people who are of lesser status and less ability who may be able to read a understand the letters to read a script written in their own language but they may not be able to have the education and the time to learn latin and read the traditional literary canon and because we have vernacular and secular writing flourishing from the 13th century onwards which means we have a lot of private writings such as uh commonplace books and books that are like just collections of text an individual makes up however since vernacular texts typically had a lower status than latin ones they were much more likely to be written in cursive script unless they were commissioned as works of literature like some witnesses of chaucer's poetry are and this brings us on to oh my that there we are this brings us on to litera gothica bastarda or hybrida which is known as bastard gothic so Litera Gothica Bastida is a compromise between calligraphic Gothic script and more cursive varieties of Gothic. It's therefore a spectrum of scripts which generally is predominated by cursive letter forms. Bastard Gothic script is a script which occupies various spheres, a bit like Carolingian, but it's not used in the most bespoke manuscripts. So you can have more formal and less formal versions of Bastard Gothic script. It's the script of marginalia and of glosses and it may sometimes use a thicker or a thinner nib depending on the scriptorium or the scribe and you can see the letter forms at the bottom of the screen here now you'll notice that there's a fair bit of ductus so you can see the um the curves the top of the descend ascenders and descenders this shows that the scribe is not lifting the pen off the page very much this is an example written with quite a thin nib as well you can see well you can see that the d for instance is a more cursive unseal well variety ultimately coming from unseal but we can also see some quite characteristically gothic features like the h has a descender that curves towards the left hand side they're distinguishing their v's and their w's um the t is biting 
we have two varieties of the S. So you have the more cursive one and the uh, rounded Gothic one. And yeah, I mean, there's not too much to say about it because there's quite a varied script. So this is just one example of a German style of bastard Gothic, but they are quite varied. So here is an interesting example from the University of Toronto. And this is the only sword and buckler treatise from the early medieval era that's not written in German and which isn't Lee's Royal Armory's MSI 33. Um, and it's interestingly written in the same language as MSI 33. It's written in Latin and it uses some of the same vocabulary, although actually some of the vocabulary it uses matches up with uh, Fiore de Libri's style, even though Fiore de Libri doesn't actually teach sword and buckler fighting. Sword and buckler fighting was uh, quite commonly done with sticks as a sort of popular sport. So that might explain why this text, this very short uh, list of the guards, is included in a commonplace book. And we'll learn what the commonplace books are later on in this video. Um, if I read out, I try to read it because it's, it is difficult, it takes a bit of time, but if I read out from the top of the page, it says, Hec sunt guardiae indimicatore uh, six. So here, there are here are in there are six guards uh, f in fighting in demicazione. Sorry, in fighting. Um, si magister in cauda longa, discipulus in. Oh goodness, in cruce. Si magister in alto, discipulus discipulus in. Stoaco. St mm, in. St Stoaco, I think. Uh, si magister in sp spatula sinistra, discipulus in dextra. Si magister in guardia falconis, discipulus in sub... And then that asset, it's sort of, the word is a bit blurred, I can't make it out. Si magister ad medium, Pectus, discipulus in palm, mm, no, no, in in plena, I think, in plena. Si magister sunt acella, discipulus in socta, si magister in plena, discipulus in sangia. Sanguinus, si magister in cruce discipulus in spatula sinistra, and I don't know what that last word is. Um, so this whole formula of si magister in discipulus in is basically a list of different guards. So if the master adopts a certain guard, the disciple should or the student should adopt a different guard. Now the, even these terms of um, master and disciple or student are terms that are found likewise in MSI 33 and they're found in Fiore de Libri's treatise to my knowledge they're not really found in the German treatise so this is an interesting linguistic distinction between the Italian and German sources um, the names of these guards though are quite different so it might indicate a separate style for fighting with sword and buckler that we don't have a full record of and this also goes to show you the kinds of fighting knowledge that everyday people are trying to learn. They don't necessarily want to know everything or all the finest techniques of how you fight with a sword and buckler, all of the weird tricks. They just want to know the basics. If, if I see the guy with the sword above his head, what should I do? How should I position myself? And this is what this person has recorded in their personal commonplace book. Here's another example written in a quite formal variety of um, bastard gothic script. And this is an example of quite a common method of medieval ped pedagogy. So we have a memory verse at the top, which is separated into lines, and this condenses knowledge on a given subject, in this case, fighting. And there's a prose gloss, which is written by a scholar below it, and this expounds further on the topic, and it can explain the poetry and give more information. So the poetry here is uh, Lichtenauer's Merkeverse. So this is like a memory verse that inc incorporates the core elements of his combat system 
And then I believe this is Peter Danzig, the priest, who writes one of the earliest recensions of Lichtenauer's verse. And this manuscript, I believe, dates from the either the very late 1300s or early 1400s. And his prose commentary expla- explains much more information about how you actually execute the techniques. Um, if I'm honest, my German and my ability to read the script is not the best. So I'll try and read out just the verse for the time being. Um, Wer überwindet, überlauf den du wirst beschämt, wann es glitzend oben, so stärkt das Höhe und Loben, dem Arbeit macht oder rückt zweifach, I think. Um, and, you know, it's, it's too difficult for me, I think. Um, you know, wer überwindet, something like when he sort of winds in about from above Überlauf den wird beschämt run uh, run over then you will be shamed i i don't know i'm not going to put my neck out i used to be better at german but especially not middle high german i struggle i need to like look up words and i'd have to check it but here i can this i can actually read. this is um my forte this is medieval italian and it's the end of um goodness the Los Angeles Getty Museum, MS Ludwig XV 13. And what this is, is it's the most elaborate um, version of Fiore de Libri's manuscripts, of which we have four containing his fighting treatise, um, Il Fiore di Battaglia, or The Flower of Battle. And this version was commissioned especially by uh, the Duke Niccolo d'Este, and Fiore says in the prologue that d'Este knew that there were other books by this fencing master Fiore, but he asked Fiore to make a book which contained all of his knowledge of the art of fighting, um, so that he would have a complete version of it. And Fiore seems to have written this book near the end of his life, because we have this little ending, the last bit of text in the book, which says, Qui finisse lo libro che ha fatto lo scolardo Fiore, che so che lo sa in quest'arte, qui la posto. Zoe in tutta l'armezzare, in questo libro, e lo fior di fior di battaglia per nome e lo è chiamato. Quello perché e lo è fatto sempre sia appreciato che tra e virtù non si trova lo parecchio. Fior forlan a voi si ricomanda, povero vecchio. So this means, um, he has ended the book which the scholar Fiore made namely who placed into this book everything that he knows in this art namely in all the art of armed combat in this book and fiore called this book um the flower of battle by name um to the one may the person for whom this book is made that is the duke of este um always be appreciated for his nobility and virtue for there is no equal found to him fiore Fulano. So, so, so Fiore the Friulian um, recommends or offers up this book to you, a poor old man, povero vecchio, and he's, Fiore is a really braggadocious character, he often writes about how he's this amazing fencing master, he's like the best of the best, and masters were jealous of him because of how great he was, he's very Trumpian in the way he writes, and he's like, uh, I beat them all and they were just so jealous that I wouldn't teach them because I'm so amazing and all my students went on to win all these battles and these are the best techniques in the whole world and then this is partly a humility topos but also Fiore sort of writes um, in the prologue to this book that he's willing to write a book with his whole art in it partly so that he won't be forgotten and then I get this sense in this prologue of like almost like humility in the face of old age and death he says you know here at the end you know nearing the end of my life i a sort of feeble old man i i I offer this up to you and this is going to be my legacy and i just i just love this a really endearing little little bit of a little message i guess from fiori de libri so there you go now it's a good time to talk about something that i have been mentioning uh throughout this video but not properly dove into and that is commonplace books which in German are known as Hausbücher and in Latin they're known as a Vade Mecum which means sort of walk with me um, and these are books which are u- used as repositories for whole texts or excerpts from which which the authors have need of so it's almost like 
it's not quite a diary, but it's like a scrapbook where pe medieval people would write down bits of text that they might find useful. And they emerged as a more widespread phenomenon in the 15th century when literacy had penetrated into the middling orders of society. And commonplace books, because they're very low status, they're literally not for display, they're just for the individual to read and write, they were almost always written in a bastard Gothic script and they're not very calligraphic. But they're really important tools to help us study the circulation of general knowledge, right? Because if it's the kind of thing that somebody's writing down in almost like a scrapbook to remember, it's the kind of stuff that they're reading in books or maybe just hearing and finding useful so it's worth noting down. So this tells us all sorts of stuff about daily life, folklore, and the social lives of texts. It tells us like which kinds of texts were actually catching on among the people and which were maybe had a more limit had a more limited circulation, perhaps among monastics. So if we have a text that is only ever copied in calligraphic Gothic script in manuscripts associated with monasteries, this could tell us that it's a text that only really was popular among the the monks in like monastic circles but if we have a text that's also popular in commonplace books and people are making excerpts from it like the sword and buckler excerpt we saw earlier this indicates that the text might have been had a more widespread appeal and because of the personal nature of these um commonplace books they tend to be less subject to the destructive processes of choir sharing which in other manuscripts is quite commonly the cause of disintegration and disordering which is basically to say that because they're someone's personal book, they're less likely to take bits out of this book and trade them with other people um, to copy them or whatever. So commonplace books are more likely to stay complete from the to the present day from the time of their creation. Here is an example of a commonplace book, and it's it's quite interesting. It's a spell written in a mixture of Latin and German. Um, and I cannot read it, but I can read off like a couple of words in the first line for you, um, thankfully, because that's Latin. Um, and it says, um, Ut videas mille milites armati in campo ante te. So it means this is a spell so that you can see, so you can summon a thousand armed soldiers into the field in front of you. It's quite exciting. And this is just a spell to summon an army for you found in a commonplace book. Really interesting. Um, I actually recommend reading the original because, um, especially if you speak German, because I'm not going to go fully into it. I translated it properly as part of my dissertation back in the day. But basically it describes this process of going to a um, to a tree by a river and cutting off for one for your personal use, which gives us this image that quite opposite to what we see in Harry Potter, where a wand is a lifelong tool that you have. It seems that ones, at least in this spell, are just very ad hoc. Like you go there, you get something that you can use to point, and then you draw things in the ground, and you sp get, you speak these examples and speak these incantations rather. And um, the um, the incantation in this case summons some creature called Gribello, um, which might be the name of a demon. Very, this is just really metal stuff. I love it. Um, so. Let's talk about what we have been talking about, basically, um, fight books and applied paleography. So fight books can be provisionally defined as any book that substantially records the bodily techniques employed in physical combat. So we can use the, we can read fight books and we can learn from them how medieval people fought in various contexts. The earliest is Leeds Royal Armory's MSI 33. And these Almost all of these, with the exception of the um, MS Francais 1996 in the BNF, all of the rest of them um, from the 1500s ish are sorry, from the 1400s and 1300s are written in some variety of cursive or bastard Gothic script. And studying the paleography of these books can tell us a lot about their context and usage. So, the Fiori book I showed you earlier, we can tell from the high quality of its calligraphy that it's quite a prestigious book, whereas the sword and buckler techniques in the commonplace book earlier, their script is much less formal, it's clearly not meant for sharing, so this indicates that it's a, well, a less prestigious, uh, more personal kind of book. And the corpus of fight books is actually quite heterogeneous, and it records quite a range of styles, but we can identify some commonalities. So, 
Most 15th century fight books are written in German, and there are only five in Italian and three in Latin, and only one of those is quite large, um, and that is, of course, the um, MS I-33. There is, of course, also one in French, which I didn't think to mention, because it's only one. Um, most fight books focus on unarmored foot soldiers fighting with a sword in two hands. It seems to have been because this was a weapon particularly associated with the knightly classes, so it was very prestigious. Um, in illuminated manuscripts of chivalric literature, we often see fight scenes drawn out with knights fighting with a sword in two hands, even if they're wearing full armour. Um, so this might have been emulated in the fight books because it was the way that knights were understood to fight. And most fight books seem to have some kind of association with Germanic culture. So Fiore de Libri learned under German authors and Filippo de Vardi, who copied Fiore de Libri, would therefore obviously have some German influence through Fiore. Um, BNF MS Francais 1996 and possibly the um, Sword and Buckler one we looked at earlier, they're the only long treatise we have, well uh, yeah, MS Francais 1996 is the only long treatise we have that doesn't have any obvious um, German influence, um, with, of course, the author supposedly being Milanese and it's being written in French. We don't have an obvious connection with the Germanic traditions that we have. But most of the recorded fight books we have are German. And this brings us to the end. So I will show you, actually, um, the earliest one that's in English, I believe this is from, from the late 1400s, and it's in the British Library. Very interesting uh, manuscript. Um, it seems to record these like practice forms, a bit like kata in, in a karate that you can practice on your own at home. And so this says um, from Big T, the fairest are playing on the beginning of the substance of the two horn sword. The first grown the beginneth with an hawk bearing in with the foot, with a double ronda, with three feet hooterward, and as many hinward, maketh end of the play with a quarter truss, smiting with an hawk, swatch setting down by the foot. So this is, there's actually um, a really interesting article by goodness, maybe Daggerthorn, I'm forgetting his name, Descri um, discussing how to analyse these, right? Because a lot of the words, we don't really know what they mean, like, a, well, a hawk, we think it might be some kind of slashing motion, but we don't really have good analogues for it, because we don't have very many medieval English fight books. Um, we don't know what a round is, as an example, it's very confusing. Um, and this weird one, the beginning of the substance of the two-handed sword. That's not a kind of word that's very often used in describing the fight books. And the first ground as well. Um, maybe this refers to elementary starts of training. It's really hard to say. Um, but some of these lines, bearing in with the foot in the fourth line, um, with a double round, this seems to suggest that you're sort of moving the foot when you're striking but again it's really hard to say we have directions of moving your feet inwards and outwards um it is quite interesting stuff but very mysterious i don't really know how to interpret it here is another one which is quite pretty and it's in german i'm not going to try and read it, but this is a copy of uh lichtenauer's verse and The if you look at if you look at the um, third line from the bottom, sorry, fourth line from the bottom, with a, with a big U and D, um, und vor allen Dingen und Sachen stellt du wissen, uh, stellt du uh, wissen und wissen und wissen, dass nur eine Kunst ist des Schwertes, um, and before all things and reasons, may you know that. May you understand and know that there is only one art of the sword, and this is the concept I mentioned earlier. That they have this concept that the um, that the art of fighting is all the same, and even from the very beginning, a high sich an Meister Lichtenauer's Kunst des Fechtens mit deiner goodness. 
sorry, I don't, I don't fully know how to translate Medina, Flüter, Ein Wusser und Zurosse, Bloß und in Harnische. Um, but this is, um, this is called um, Master Lichtenauer's Art of Fighting, so Fechten, so it's just generic fighting. And I believe this is, um, I think this is on horseback, on foot, in armour and out of armour. So the Mit Deiner Fliss is the one that, Schutz is the one I'm not sure, but, I'm, but I think this is um, on horseback. Zufuse, uh, on foot, und Zurosse. Um, Mm. Oh, that maybe that's horse. I don't know. Anyway, bloß und in Harnische is like naked and well, not naked, like in just your clothing. Und in Harnische, harness is like in your armor. So this is saying that this is Master Lichtenauer's art of fighting in all kinds of styles. And it's worth noting that Fiore de Liberi not only does he actually teach how to fight in all those scenarios on horseback, uh, unarmored and in armor, and on foot. Um, but he lays it out in the same way. So this is the art of fighting uh, on foot, on horse, uh, in armour and out of armour. It's very interesting. And perhaps Fiore has basically interpreted Lichtenauer's earlier 13th century memory verse in his own style. Because we know that Fiore learned from German masters like those who would have been practising Lichtenauer's style. So very interesting. Lichtenauer... I've been mentioning a fair bit, but I've not been clarifying. Lich Johannes Lichtenauer seems to be this mythical, um, brilliant German fencing master of the early 1300s who created this memory verse which contains the, his art of combat and later writers in the 1400s would repeat and follow in Lichtenauer's footsteps and practice his same style but with their own slight modifications on it. And it's really popular. Loads of Lichtenauer manuscripts are preserved. Here is the, um, a picture from the earliest one. I thought I should at least show some of the artwork that you get in MSI 33. Um, I should do a proper deep dive on this manuscript because I actually wrote a paper on it for during my master's. But um, these weird lines around the, um, the buckler are actually from a child in the, I believe, 1500s or 1600s who just went through and like scribbled on. And actually, in some of these pictures, he's actually drawn... Um, little beards and moustaches on the priests and these scholars. It's so cute. Um, really adorable. And this uh, this manuscript here on the page, we can see the use of the memory verse, but also of a prose learning format as well. So on the right hand side, it says, Custodia prim prima uh, venit, uh, re retinet contraria bina. Contrarium primum halpsit langord secundum. So this is the memory verse. It's in Latin poetry, and that's scored through in red so that you know that it's um, a special thing to pay attention to. And then on the left hand side, we have a prose explanation of the um, of the meaning of the of the poem. So it says, uh, "Notendum hic uh, continetu prima custodia uh, videlicet sub brachio." So it is to be noted that here is contained the first guard, namely the guard that starts under the arm, and this is the guard that the priest is um, using. Quius obsessio vero half shield, whose whose ward is half shield, and that is the position that the scholar on the right hand side is using. And then it goes on to give various advice as to what the priest should do, what the scholar should do, etc. Very interesting stuff. Um, this also shows the possibly the use of combat in spheres we wouldn't normally expect to find it in among the clergy. Um, the best theory I've seen is that these are retired secular priests who used to be soldiers, maybe they've even come back from crusades, and they've learned all these skills for fighting with sword and buckler and they want to put it to use. An alternative is that they are simply recording this because it's a good sport and it, they happen to really enjoy it. So it's quite a mysterious manuscript, very interesting. The very earliest fight book that we have, and you can see it all available for free online. I highly recommend you do, especially if you can speak Latin. Here is the beginning of Johannes Lichtenauer's uh, Merkeverse in a commonplace book, and it's it's quite a it's quite a fun um, 
verse actually it's very dramatic it's very chivalrous it emphasizes knightly values as well he sort of brings out this aesthetic of combat besides the just the raw raw brutality of actually fighting i'm not going to read it for you but you can you can have a look at that yourself and here to end is a recently discovered fencing treatise from the end of the 15th century which shows you how we're in this field of medieval martial arts we're still discovering new texts and new information all the time and i said at least after my dissertation because i actually wrote my master's dissertation on um sword combat with a sword in one hand in the 15th century and i thought at the time that i had recorded and transcribed all of the uh manuscripts containing such techniques from the time but then this one was released afterwards and it it doesn't prove me wrong but it undermines my argument a little bit in complicated ways but you can see what some of the artwork looks like from this time period and likewise above we can see a memory poem written in quite a well quite a fancy variety of bastard gothic script so i will um leave it here i've rambled on for a very long time about medieval martial arts because i'm very passionate about it if you because medieval martial arts and fighting really is my area of greatest expertise within the middle ages if watching this video you want me to do a manuscript deep dive discussing any of these individual manuscripts more closely um i can especially do msi 33 ms ludwig xv13 ms uh morgan m383 or any of just any of the manuscripts by Fiore de Libri I can talk quite a lot about because I've read a lot about these and if you want me to do a manuscript deep dive discussing them uh, just let me know in the comment section and I'm very happy to um, so until next video thank you guys for watching and bye